and good afternoon. I would like to draw your attention to some announcements. The first one is not going to be up front, but it's a little card I'm going to hand you. The FCA, not FFC, that would be Faith, FCA would be Faith Community Church, and it's also the Federal Communication Association. So the other, never mind, I won't try to compare the two initials. I'll get myself confused. Have changed their rules on text messages sent from churches. What it seems it now considers is because we inform you of information, when we send you a text, it falls under advertising rules, not just for our church, but for all churches. <laughs> Therefore, you need to do something in order to get text messages from the church. You need to text yes to this number with your cell phone. You don't have to do it now. You can do it later. If we continue to have issues with it, you will need to, you will then need to sign a consent form. <laughs> Actually, we're all good right here. You're all good too, because I signed you up earlier. So I, yeah, I, I texted to make sure it was working. Here we go. I think you guys have had it. This was one of those changes that took us kind of su by surprise. We were aware that it was coming, but we didn't know how it would be rolled out until it did. And now we are cooperating, getting it all taken care of. If, we have, if you have an issue when you text your number to that and it doesn't come back and say you're all signed up, then you need to see Kathy, who's sitting here. She's got her hand up. She'll meet you at the back of the church, and she has little consent forms you can fill out. They're little tiny cards. We're doing our best to keep you informed. But I will tell you this, the text messages really do help us because a lot of times we can just get out quick information, especially as you're coming in the winter when there's going to be storm cancels, etc. It's the way we do it. You will notice we send very few text messages from the church, but we really do want our congregation to be able to receive them. The Free Methodist History Doctrine and Practices class starts next Sunday. If you have not watched the first video, you can go to our website, and on our website, there's a section that says um, Free Methodist Church. You click on it. The first video is already up there. We encourage you to watch that. That's the introductory video. Please speak to me if you're having any issues with that. There's two parts to it. One is we're having a class so that you can learn the history, doctrine, and practices of the Free Methodist Church to prepare you for when we take our vote to become a full Free Methodist Church. That's part A. Part B is I'm also doing my doctoral dissertation on that class, and if you wish to be part of that, you will see there's a release form that's already on there that we ask you to read over. Um, and before you take the first class, instructions will be very clear. You'll have an opportunity to fill out that release form. That one is only up there for your information, just so you know what you're signing. The actual release form will get signed at the time of when you start the classes, which would be either a week from Sunday or when the first video is posted. We appreciate people's participation. Also, Trunk and Treat is tomorrow. If you wish to get kids here or come and help, we'd love to have you help. It's from 2 to 3. Giving tree applications. If you know anyone who's needing help at Christmas, we do a wonderful um, outreach from our church, and you'll be hearing more about that as a congregation. But this is really the applications for people who are struggling at Christmas. They need their applications in by November 1st. Pi Day is coming up on November 9th. You'll see that. There's sign-up sheets out in the entryway for you to donate items or to come and help pie, make pies. All of that goes to our outreach. None of that supports the church. Those all go to efforts that we have to help in the community. And likewise, it's time for us to put together our Thanksgiving baskets. We do not do a pantry for November and December. Instead, we put together our Thanksgiving baskets, and there's out, I am looking right at it, there's a table sitting out in the entryway, and you can sign up there for any items you wish to donate if you'd like to be part of our Thanksgiving baskets. We give out 20 baskets to families, both through our church and through another Free Methodist Church, 
and then any other ones into our community. Thank you very much for being here today, and let us now start with our call to worship. I will fulfill my vows to you, O God. For you have rescued me from death. So now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your light. And let us stand together. Drake and Marty are usually with us. Marty has come down with an upper respiratory bug, so they're not here. So I will not be able to call on Drake to come forward to lead our hymn, but it's one we should all know. This is Reformation, Reformation Weekend as we celebrate the Reformation that brought about the Protestant tradition, and we sing that wonderful song of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, found on page number 35. Please be seated. 
And Ms. Regina will take back those who are going back for our children's time. As the kids are being dismissed, we also invite you to join with me in our unison prayer. God of all ages, who from generation to generation has heard the cries of your children, humbly seeking forgiveness, and has welcomed sinners back into your embrace, hear the thoughts of our hearts, examine our motives, forgive us our faults of word and action. We ask this through your Son, who died that we may know the true cost of forgiveness. Amen. And now we take time and lift up the prayer concerns of our congregation. If there's names of individuals you would like to have lifted up. First, again, as I mentioned, we lift up Marty Irby. Our government, especially as we are in the final phases of a presidential election, if none of you have noticed, it is a week from Tuesday. <laughs> Little humor. Oh, thank you. Sue Gill is going in this Wednesday, um, and just prayers that all things would go well. So, are you going in the hospital? It's one day. Surgical cots up. And Doug, who's normally on our tech, he and his wife are on a cruise. We pray for them to enjoy the last phases of their cruise. Debbie and Nancy, I heard, are they both ill? Is that what it is? Yeah, there's been a lot of bronchial stuff going around. Also, um, Laura's mom has also had the same thing. She's doing better, so also prayers for Gina. Son, Donald. Okay. Your cousin, Little Wesley. Thank you. There was also a shooting we heard downtown last evening, and somebody lost their life. Certainly don't like to hear of anything like that. And prayers for peace and not violence in our communities. Let's bow our heads and hearts together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that we can pause and worship and come before you and know that you are God and we can trust you. We can hear your word. We can fellowship with each other. And you are present in all that we do. We pray for the, each of these concerns. We pray for health and healing and comfort. Pray for Sue as she goes in for this consult. May all things go well. Pray for Doug as he travels, for others we've lifted up today. For this gentleman who lost his life and for his family. Pray for peace in our communities. We pray especially during this time of, of the election where also in other areas that people can just lose friendships and have disharmony in their families. We pray that people would learn to love and accept each other as people come to their convictions of who to vote for. And we pray for our country. We pray for your justice to be worked out in our midst. We pray also for things that are happening in our church, for a trunk and treat tomorrow, for kids who will be up here visiting, some from families that are unchurched. We pray that we could build relationships and spread the gospel to new families. We pray for our game night this evening as families come to this church and just enjoy a time of, of food and fellowship together. We pray for a men's retreat. We have 12 guys going next weekend and pray for Pastor David and others as they travel, help that men's retreat up in Berea go well. And for all the things, we give you thanks. We think of the Reformation and the faith of Martin Luther and others who followed, who brought about this wonderful Protestant tradition by challenging and standing on the firm foundation of your word. We continue, hundreds of years later, continuing to have that same struggle to always remain faithful to scripture and not let the other things of this world distract and creep in and try to get us to believe something different. May our faith be founded on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and on your word, which we know is true, and is dependable. 
And so for each of these prayers and others we hold in our heart, we lift them before you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you came prepared to make an offering to Faith Community Church, you can do it either by using the two offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary. There's also one at the side. Or you can always go online to faithcommunityma.com and there you can use the Donate Now button. People have asked about our hurricane offering. We took up a hurricane relief offering. We are over $4,000 has been taken in, so thank you very much to everyone who has donated to that. 100% of that offering goes to help the victims of the most recent hurricanes, and our contributions are made through Samaritan's Purse. We'll now take time to hear our offertory. Father, we offer these our gifts of tithes and offerings. We pray your blessing upon each gift and upon each giver. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and turn to hymn number 652. As we sing together, we believe in God the Father.
Amen. And please be seated. We're going to talk today about one of the most crucial times and moments that happens in any person's life. It's called in-between time, commonly known as logo, uh, uh, limbo, the middle, anything like that. In-between time is the crucial transition period between when a person is in the before and when a person is in the after. It can be really uncomfortable. Think of any of the in-betweens that you have faced so far in your life the vast majority of them tend to be uncomfortable, but we know through experience, through academia, through psychologists and everything in between, that these moments can be the most essential for growth as they bridge what was in our life with what will soon be to come. Let's think of an example of an in-between time. When you have nine months of pregnancy, that's the most basic in-between time. Here's another one. An election season is an in-between time. When someone is getting ready to retire, an in-between time. When you have a little baby in diapers, once the baby didn't exist, hopefully it won't be there forever, in-between time. There's countless in-between times we can be between jobs. We can be going through a profound illness that isn't a forever illness, but is a period of our lives it's in between. It bridges the before and the after. I could go on and talk about first years of sobriety and anything else. But what we want to be clear on is that in our in-between times, the question is, how do we face them? When I was a little kid, you may have had this experience, but I had a wonderful backyard. We grew up in Rhode Island. I recently went back to Rhode Island and there was a sign that said, you belong here. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be nice? I do like Rhode Island. And behind my parents' house in Rhode Island, there was this long field. And at the end, there was this wonderful, um, it was this wonderful stone fence. It was just this wonderful, idyllic New England backyard. And as a little kid, six, seven years old, I used to love running back and forth between the house and the fence. But there was something in the way. What was in the way? a big thistle patch. Did you ever have this experience? And so what I learned very quickly is, for whatever reason, in all of my formative memories, I was never wearing shoes. So what I learned in these memories is that if you run through the thistles, what happens? You get a bloody foot, it hurts, it's all sorts of, it's not a great little kid experience. When we approach a thistle patch, you can get through it as long as you tread carefully, deal with it appropriately, and continue forward. That's what we're going to see with Elijah. In between times are like thistle patches. They are necessary. They are there. We have to go through them. This guy, Ahab, has been king. He's the seventh king of the northern kingdom. And his whole kingship has been running through thistles. That's all he does. The guy just like takes his shoes off, runs through, gets a bloody foot, and blames it on Elijah or the other believers. So let's backtrack. What has happened? There was this wonderful king named David, and he had a son named Solomon, and it was the high point of Jewish history. They built a temple, and all sorts of amazing things happened, but then there was a civil war. Kingdom split into north and south. In the north kingdom, there were seven kings, none of them good, none of them we will elect in November. All bad guys didn't follow God, and now King Ahab is the seventh. For three years, we've had this drought because of Ahab's idolatry, he followed this fake water god, and we had all sorts of just nonsense happening. The drought has now come coming to an end. Why? Because we just had a big showdown where this prophet, what is a prophet? A prophet is a person who speaks the words of God. This prophet has come and said, you have a choice. Worship God and serve God. Worship other things like Baal and serve other things. You got to choose. You got to pick a side today's decision day. Supernaturally, spectacularly, fire comes down from heaven, makes it clear that only God is real. The drought is now going to come to an end. And there's this wonderful, short, little, strange text, six verses today, strange little text where Ahab's going to go have an angry dinner. Elijah's going to go pray to God on a mountain. And you're going to see that how we deal with the in-between, with the transition time, it really matters. It really makes a difference. 
not only on how we feel and what others see as we're going through the transition, but it really makes a difference as we look with a long view on our lives. In between times, let us choose a perspective. There's only two here. You can say that God is with me, or you can say God is not with me. Now, you can nuance it. You can say God's not with me because I reject this or whatever, but the the truth is, is that there are two perspectives as we go through an in-between time. We can know that we have God with us. He's imminent with us. That's a big theological term. He's here with us in the world. He loves us. He's with us. He goes through life with us. Or you can say, yeah, God isn't with me. i got to kind of figure this out on my own. In this text today, one of the characters is going to really function with this God is with me. And we're going to focus on Elijah and how he sees that God is with him. God is with us when we face in between times. And so what we're going to see from Elijah is we want to dedicate the time to God. We want to persevere. We want to become a herald. So let's say this together and we're going to get started. God is with us during in-between times, so what do we do? We want to, like Elijah, dedicate the time to God, persevere, and become a herald. So let's begin the text as we see how Elijah dedicates this time to God. Remember, the showdown at Mount Carmel has happened. The drought is coming to an end. Life should be really good. There isn't bad news right now. Things are good. We're moving forward. Let's see how the characters respond. Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. So something happened. What happened? You had this big showdown, and now we're in this in-between time. We're in this middle portion. One of the characters is having an angry meal. He's frustrated because he had this whole thing where Ahab had all these different prophets that were false prophets from his wife Jezebel, and they've all been proved wrong, and they're now gone. They're not employed by the kingdom anymore. And now this guy Ahab is told, hey, go eat dinner. And rather than saying, hey, you know what, Elijah, I've learned my lesson. I want to dedicate this moment to God and say, wow, we're in this interesting in-between in my life, in the kingdom. And you know what, Elijah, I'm going to appropriately go with you on the mountain. Let's humble ourselves together. Let's be in a right-sized posture. Instead, he takes off. He moves on. Nothing has changed in his life. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And that's what's happened with Ahab. He's been an angry guy. He continues to be an angry guy. He's miserable. However, Elijah does something different. Elijah, he's in his probably early 50s, we assume, and he climbs a mountain. Now, he doesn't go get a meal. He just says, you know what? Something has happened. And this something is of God. Because I saw a fire come down from heaven. And I know that the drought is coming to an end. I know rain is coming for the first time in three years. So it's my responsibility to take seriously that this is God's time. This is a sacred moment. This matters. I'm going to go to the mountain. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in the right posture with my life. And I'm going to bow low to the ground, and see what God has next for me. Elijah didn't just move on. He saw sacred. That's one of the big keys that we want to think as we're in our in-betweens. It's so easy. Let's take some of those examples. In-between jobs, okay? It's hard to stop and to dedicate the time to God when we're in-between jobs. It's easy to be frustrated, to blame people, to blame ourselves, to just be all in on constantly interviewing and just focusing completely on that. What we have the chance to do as Christians when we're in something like in between jobs is say, wow, I serve God. A season has ended. Another season will begin. This is a holy moment. This is a moment where my actions matter. The way I speak to people matters. The way I treat my family members matters. The posture and structure and routine of my day, if my day is just Cheetos and Mountain Dew and depression, that's not going to help me when I go into my new job. But if my day is I get up, I work out, I pray, I am kind to my family, I appropriately job hunt and I move forward trusting that God has what's best for me next, things get a lot better. 
dedicating the time to God. I like to say it like this. You're in an in, uncertain in-between time. Here's a line you can steal from me. Here we are, God. What's our next step? Here we are, God. What's our next step? Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say, oh, God, you've put me in this situation. What, what am I going to do? Or, oh, Lord, I've, I've messed up. What am I going to do next? Here we are, God. We're together. You're with me. You're imminent. What's our next step together? I dedicate this moment to you. If that means climbing a mountain, let's climb a mountain. If that means just being appropriately humble, praying, bowing low, understanding that you have good things for me, awesome. In between times are sacred times. It's interesting, in the first year or so of ministry, I've learned that when families face in between times in the hospital, the minister faces an in between time in his car. Did you know this? If your loved one gets driven up to Boston, is there traffic on the way to Boston? Yes, and the minister puts his badge on, and he now endures a traffic jam for like an hour or an hour and a half, and then has about a nice, kind, pleasant 45-minute visit. And of course, now it's rush hour, so it's now two and a half hours back. The truth is, is that, and I've chatted with ministry colleagues of mine, the main things we do as pastors is we wait and we drive. Okay? There's a lot of in-between times. This is a lot of in-between moments. So as families are going through their own in-between moments in illnesses in the hospitals, what I've learned is take my little clergy badge, put it on my mirror, and realize, you know, I'm going to lose a lot of my day to have a 45-minute visit. But not only is that visit sacred time, I'm going to give that time to God, but all the rest of it is too, because how I live matters. And that's what I invite you to think about your life. Maybe you are like me and you're going on important things and you're going to be present with people, but you have to get there and you have to transit and you have to be stuck in a traffic jam. We can dedicate that time to God. Maybe you have something really exciting in your life and you say, wow, I can't wait to get to this thing all those moments between now and that thing, those all matter. We can dedicate them to God. We can live the right way. And so my question for you is, do you dedicate in between time to God? Do you call it sacred? We call church sacred, okay? Church is sacred. The worship service is a sacred time. The time in limbo is sacred time too. God is with us. God is with us in the transition. As we are getting ready for something big to happen... God is still with us, therefore that time is sacred. So we want to dedicate the time to God. We also want to persevere. Elijah shows us to face our in-between times. Yes, we dedicate that time to God because every moment of every day, God is with us and it becomes holy, sacred, important time. We also want to persevere. We also want to be people who keep going, who, like Dory, remember Finding Nemo? Just keep swimming. There's a moment where we just have to keep going. Look at what Elijah happens. So let's be clear on our text. Ahab, angry dinner. Elijah, gone up the mountain. Prays, believes that God is going to bring the rain. And now he and his servant have to deal with the fact that they look out and there's not a cloud in the sky. Watch what happens. Elijah said to his servant, go out and look toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. If I, I've got a glass of water here, but if I ask someone here, hey, go get me a thing of water once, you might do it. Twice, you might do it. If I asked you seven times, it's hard to listen to someone seven times, isn't it? That represents a perseverance. When we're willing to do something seven times, now biblically, what is seven? Ready? Creation. How many days are in creation? Seven, okay? The perfect number, seven. The number of completion, seven. So anytime we see something positive in Scripture happen seven times, we can say, oh, this is, this is a hint that this is something about God's completion. So what we see here is that Elijah's servant and him, because let's be honest, both the underling and the boss, 
They're working together here. They're persevering together. The underling is going. The boss keeps saying, hey, just, just go back. Go back. I know, I, I, know you haven't, I know you haven't seen the rain cloud yet. Go look again. We see this perseverance. When we face in between times, perseverance is key. What did Elijah do? He persevered after six failures. We live in a time of such instant gratification, we could say, frustration, outrage, anything you want, where to persevere, to do something so many times after so many failures, we start calling that, oh, you're throwing good money after bad. Oh, that's the definition of insanity. Why would you keep going? There are moments where it may look crazy to non-believers, but because we know that God is with us, because we know He's imminent with us in the world, we keep saying, you know what? I am in an in-between time, okay? Nine months of pregnancy. I just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep persevering, knowing that God is here with me. Elijah knew that God was with him and that God is faithful. Again, when we face our times in between, there's two ways we can look at them. God is with me. God isn't with me. The problem with God isn't with me is it becomes very depressing it becomes very nihilistic and very just, it's not a good place. Don't go there. God is with us in that in-between time. Elijah said, yeah, just keep going back. It's okay. Five times is good. No, we keep going. Okay, seventh time. It was about perseverance in the face of delayed gratification, failure, and uncertainty. Because here's a, one little question I have for you. Where is your confidence is your confidence in yourself? Because there's, a, there's some healthy self-confidence we want to have. But as Christians, our primary confidence is not in a moralistic, relativistic book, but it's in a powerful God who moved. We, we know historically what he did. But the Bible isn't just a story of what happened. It's a story of what always happened. So therefore, we say, I can have confidence that just as God split the Red Sea, for example. There are things in my life that become blockades that he's willing to push through that he is more than able to push through. We talked last week about miracles. There are miracles that happen not just in Scripture, but healings that happen in our lives. There's wonderful moments of reconciliation and things, and our confidence needs to come as Christians, not just in, hey, I can get through it, but our question before. Here we are, God. How can we go forward together? What do you have for us next? How can we get through this together? I want to tell, talk to you about a man who, I don't know if he's a household name, but because I grew up with a dad who was an avid reader, he, was, he read this book, it's called Taken on Trust, and it's about the special envoy to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And his name was Terry Waite. Terry Waite, in the late 70s and early 80s, was a wonderful hostage negotiator. He was a man of faith, and he was brought into situations to calm things down and to negotiate for the release, especially in the Middle East, of hostages taken. And he, you, can look, you can look up his story, and you'll see that he had wonderful success just getting these people out of difficult situations and negotiating things. So it becomes the mid to late 80s, and he goes into yet another situation. And there's some concerns that maybe his cover has been blown. There's this whole thing about how he took a helicopter ride and maybe he's been spotted. But Terry Wade is a man of faith and he says, no, God asked me just to keep persevering and I'm going to know that God has called me in my life to be a voice for people who've been taken in captivity. So I'm going to continue negotiating for hostages. And he shows up and very quickly trust is broken and Terry Wade finds himself captive, and he's now a hostage among the hostages he was expecting to negotiate. But something interesting, he had been sending, as the special envoy to the Archbishop of Canterbury, he had been sending boxes full of books to the hostages in advance, just trying to give them something to do. And he loved especially penguin books. What's a penguin book? It's a book on penguin press, and you can tell it because it's got a little penguin, and it's orange orange and black. And so what he found out as he was sitting there for over five years in this really difficult, 
horrible in-between time that he never expected to have to go through. But a man of faith, he realized he needed to persevere. He needed to just keep going. He needed to pray. He needed to trust God. And he needed to read the penguin books that he had sent and had sent there. And there were boxes full of them. It's interesting. There was actually a language barrier between Terry and between the people who had taken him captive. And so they worked out kind of this signal. He would just point to little penguins. And anytime there was a penguin on a book, they'd bring him that book. And after many years, he was finally released, and he wrote that wonderful memoir. He also then talked about powers of forgiveness and reconciliation. But here's the point that we want to be very clear on. Culture promotes instant gratification. But as Christians, God helps us persevere through tough times. Terry Waite did not persevere just because he got through it. He understood God was with him. God was imminently with him in a personal way, even in his in-between time of unfair, ridiculous captivity. What about for us? Is your life one of perseverance? Or do you engage in a lot of instant gratification? If you asked a really trusted Christian in your life, ask them this question about yourself. Say, when you, th when you think of me, am I someone who perseveres? And just see what they say. Ask a couple Christians. And then ask this question. When you think of me, am I kind of an instant gratification guy or gal? And then listen. Is your life one of perseverance? Or do you engage in a lot of instant gratification? In our in-between times, we want to dedicate the time to God. We want to persevere. And here's an interesting one. We want to become a herald. This one seems to jump out of left field. So let's look at what the text says. Then the Lord gave special strength. Oh, pause. Okay, so why then? Okay, we got all excited because we're reading Elijah. So here's the deal. So recap the text. Ahab and Elijah go separate ways. Elijah goes to the top of the mountain. Elijah bows low, marks the moment, says, hey, God, this is your time, Lord. Here I am. Okay, then his servant is there. Elijah says, hey, rain's coming. Servant looks out, sees nothing. Seven times it happens. Finally, it's time for rain. Rain comes, and now everybody's moving forward. We're almost out of the in-between, and here we are. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. For 35 years... I always assumed that this was a foot race, that God supernaturally gave power for Elijah to outrun angry Ahab. John Walton is a wonderful academic and person who's done a lot of studying on this. He's someone that they used a lot when I was in Asbury. We would always go back to the work of John Walton, and he posits a different explanation for this text. I want to show you something. The Lord gave special strength to Elijah, so we focus on that. He tucked his cloak into his belt. Sometimes we focus on that. We're like, isn't that so funny? The guy in robes with the big beard tucks it in and runs really fast. Hilarious. And ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. If you are a student of the ancient world, this is being a herald. What is a herald? A herald was a messenger who would run ahead of a king or an army to proclaim. I want to show you that we all have background knowledge. Who here knows what a marathon is? Okay, have you ever heard the term marathon? Okay, then you know what a herald is. Because marathon is based on the, on the, it's on the story of Phidippus. And Phidippus is a man who they had victory at the Battle of Marathon. And now he had to run 26.2 miles from Marathon to Athens as a herald to tell the news of what was happening. That is what Elijah is doing here. He's being God's messenger. He's being the herald. In an in-between time, become God's herald. It's so easy in the in-between times I want to list a whole bunch. Look at this. Ready? Between jobs, nine months of pregnancy, election season, a move, time of discernment, early days of sobriety, illness, baby in diapers, getting ready to retire, 
senior year in high school, there can be a lot of frustration during those times, can't there? However, two things can be true at once. My feelings are my feelings, but God's faithfulness is God's faithfulness. God always, no matter how frustrated each of us are feeling, God is always staying faithful and continues to do things in our lives and has done things both in our lives and in the world. What we can do is be like Elijah and start to be God's herald, to rather than simply focusing on the negativity, what could Elijah have done? Come down the mountain and started proselytizing to everyone Ahab is so bad. We need to get a new king. He is the worst. God got rid of King Saul in the past. The same thing needs to happen to Ahab. No. He ran ahead as God's herald. And he continued for his whole life, just continuing being a man of faith, a man of God, living with integrity. For us, when we're coming to that time between jobs, these different discernment times, these times where we're frustrated, these times where we're coming to an end of career, coming to an end of a school year, no matter what it is, there's a lot of negative things that we can start to focus on. We can start focusing on if we're ending a time in a job that's an in-between time, we can start focusing on what everyone else is doing. We can start focusing on are they appreciating me? Am I being appreciated? Are they celebrating? That's all noise. Instead, will I take time to proclaim what God has done and is doing in my life? Will I be a herald? Will I be someone who say, Jesus loves me, this I know, and God is faithful, and God continues to be faithful, and God is working? So what does that mean? That means that during in-between times, I have strength that others don't have. I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in my heart, not only convicting me of sin, but also giving me a peace, also giving me clarity when I ask for that clarity, when I'm taking time to begin the day in prayer, when I'm taking time to have favorite scriptures. Here's a question. Let's say you face an in-between time. What scripture passages are you really resonating with? What devotions are you, are you reading? What does your prayer life look like? Will I take time to proclaim what God has done and is doing? The question isn't, will I face in-between? Because if, if we ask this question, I'll ask it about my life. 35 years old. Will I face in between in my life? Yes. I'll look around at you. Will you face in between? Yes, each of us is going to face in between. The question is not, will I? The question is, how will I respond? So I want to tell you a silly thing in my life. In the spring of 2025, we've made the decision, you need to know something for this final story. I've never gone to Disney World, okay? How many times have I gone to Disney World in my life? Okay, I'm 35 years old. How many times? Zero. So we're finally deciding to take a trip to Disney World, okay? And so you could say, oh, he must be talking about an in-between time where they're, they're now and they're all excited and he's got a three-year-old and a five-year-old. So there's all this limbo and the kids want to go tomorrow and they're so excited. I'm not talking about that because, yeah, sure, when I ask Ruby, my daughter, Hey, what are you excited about? She says, I want to see the animals. I want to go to Magic Kingdom, etc. But she told me something the other day, and this is what I want to focus on. In 2025, they're doing this new promotion where the first day you go to Disney for whatever package we're going to do, that you get a free day at a water park. And Ruby's never really been to a water park. She's really excited to go on a water slide. And I was kind of surprised by that because a water slide generally is dark and enclosed. And so her big question was, Daddy, will you, will you let me sit on your lap when I ride down the water slide? That was her big question, okay? Just think about that for a moment. I want to show you something. Daddy, will you let me ride on your lap when I'm going down the water slide? That is what an in-between time is, okay? It's, it's not the waiting for Disney. Move away from that. Going down the water slide is a scary thing. All of us have to do it. Will we dedicate the time to God, understand that he's with us, persevere, understand he's with us, and become a herald of what he's doing, understanding he's with us? Ruby, the five-year-old, going down the water slide by herself would be a terrifying, traumatic childhood incident, right? But she just says, hey, Daddy, 
would you let me sit on your lap and we ride down the water slide together? That's how we want to approach our in-between time. We do have a daddy who will let us ride down the water slide with him. His name is God, and he loves us. And he gave us Jesus, he gave us scripture, he gave us the church, he gave us Christians. And yeah, we do face moments that are difficult. We do face moments that are in between. We do face things like elections. I don't know what's going to happen in the next nine days or after that, but I know that past, present, future, God doesn't change and is faithful with us. Yes, we go through these in-between times of family illnesses, and I'm sorry about that, but past, present, future, God doesn't change, and he's with us. Do we act like Elijah and say, okay, it's not that I want to avoid in-between, but when I go down the water slide, will I dedicate the time to God? Will I persevere? Will I proclaim what he's doing in my life, becoming that herald? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the story of Elijah, the story of Scripture, the story of redemption. Lord, we just ask that today you would remind us of your presence here with us. If we have an in-between of uncertainty in a family member situation, something with work, something with our neighborhood, an election, or anything in between, Lord, remind us. It's not that we can sidestep these in-betweens, but Lord, you're with us in the in-betweens. Lord, help us remember that we can, we can dedicate the time to you, that it's a time of growth, that we can grow in our relationship with you through that time, that we can persevere, and that we can just talk about the good things you've done in each of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing together hymn number 351. our service, I do want to remind you that if you need to check on making sure that you are getting text messages from the church, as we mentioned earlier, 
Kathy is at the back of the sanctuary, and she can make sure that you get them properly set up. It's a change in the FCC rules, and that's why we are having to make this adjustment. But if you tried texting your number that we asked you earlier, it, it, and you got a message saying you're all set up, you should be fine. And now let us go forth with peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and abide in your hearts today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>